Demon Slayer's newest season has been the weakest one so far, whether that's narratively or visually. Narratively, I, I'm not gonna go in depth as to why I think it's weak, because frankly, I don't care. Very few people actually care other than the Demon Slayer super fans who are probably like clutching their fists and like, I wonder if after defeating this demon, Tanjiro will finally be able to find a cure to turn Nezuko back into human. No, I don't think anyone gives a fuck about Demon Slayer's main plot. It's just a means to set up the cool sequences. As for the cool sequences, allow me to make a very bold prediction. There's gonna be a Toshi Yukishira episode that's gonna conclude the fight. It's gonna have groundbreaking visuals. Everyone, including me, is gonna lose their minds. We're gonna completely forget about the first half of the season that was a complete drag to get through. We're gonna rate the season 8.5 on 10 and then move on. But I'm going to make this video so that I immortalize the fact that the first half of the season has been a drag. It's been very... How do you say it? And if you want to know why, it's not really a surprise. Uh, Ufotable is doing three projects simultaneously right now, aside from Demon Slayer, and also another Type Moon project. I'm assuming the most amount of resources are going into the Type Moon project, as usual. This was also the case with Demon Slayer Season 1. Most of the, the resources went into the Fate Hemisphere movies. And the resources I'm talking about, it's not in terms of production schedule or even animators. It was directors. Demon Slayer Season 1 did not have as many of the Fotable's talented directors as it required. Therefore, a lot of Season 1's episodes, uh, like 11, if I'm not mistaken, were storyboarded by the series director. And he's definitely the least creative main member in Ufotable's team. Like the art director, phenomenal. The director of photography, Yuichi Taro is the best in the industry. Akira Matsushima, genius veteran character designer and chief animation director. And then the chief director, Sotozaki, who adapts manga panels one-to-one. -one. So yeah, it's just a repeat of season one of Demon Slayer, uh, albeit it's even worse this time, because as I said, they're not parallelly working between two productions now, it's three productions. And I'd say all three are hyperfile productions. And unfortunately, Demon Slayer, has been getting the short end of the stick. Most of the episode directors and animators who worked on these first few episodes have been junior animators and episode directors. And yes, that is a good thing that they are nurturing young stuff. But Demon Slayer is a heavily restrictive project. A lot of people watch this show and it's the main IP of the studio. So a lot of people have a certain expectation from the show, which makes it a difficult project to work on. A good example of letting the creative juices flow is like Ufotable's B team working on uh, today's menu with the Emir family. And that side project was like better than most of their main projects because of the creative freedom the people who worked on the show had. I'm getting sidelined. I'm going to come back now. Yes. The first few episodes of Demon Slayer has been a drag, as expected when a studio works on multiple projects. Plus, they also did blow off a lot of resources for the Upper Moon meeting, so that's definitely a factor that comes into play here. But all of the mediocrity, it ends now, because with the new episodes of Demon Slayer, it's a return to form. I'll just give you like a stat sheet of this episode. It's no longer a junior storyboarder who's working as the episode director. It's Nanaka Sensei, who is one of the best directors on Ufotable. He's been with Ufotable ever since the name Ufotable was a thing. As far as animation goes, there are four sequences that really stood out to me. Two of them by Ufotable Ace animators, one by a returning freelancer, really good to see her back in action, and one by Artist Unknown, and I really want to know who actually animated this because this is my favorite sequence from this episode. As far as the directorial vision for this episode goes, Nonaka is clearly trying to make the episode look like a manga adaptation first. And it's very different from, let's say, Blue Lock's latter half, where yes, oh, everything looked one to one of the manga because the team did not have any time to make the actual creative storyboards for the anime itself. So they just decided to adapt the manga one to one. I wouldn't be surprised if they literally had the manga panels copy pasted as the storyboards. But here, the one to one manga anime sequences, it does not feel like it was a limitation of creativity or time or resources. It feels like the people who made this episode, they sat down and thought, how can we be most faithful to the manga and still make it look good? And this is what they came up with. It feels more similar to, here's an unrelated comparison, like Zack Snyder's live action adaptations of um, comic books. There is a certain degree of skill required to actually adapt source material one-to-one -one in a completely different medium. There's a very thin line between doing that and doing what Sotozaki does, which is, this is manga panel, I make it move. That does not look good, but this definitely does feel very different from that. 
And honestly, I think that difference just comes from the animation being really solid. It does not matter if that if it's not that creative of a storyboard, if it's Nozomu Abe animating it, right? Like the last Yutaka Nakamura sequence from My Hero Academia, it was definitely the weakest direction I've ever seen for a Yutaka Nakamura sequence. But at the end of the day, it's still a Yutaka Nakamura sequence. So it's gonna look more than just above average. I've also seen a lot of people say that the flow of this episode, the flow between sequences was not that good. And some people say it's worse than episode four direction. I don't know if we watched the same episode. Episode four is the weakest episode of the show. And episode five is a massive, massive improvement. And that's about it. That's the statistics of this episode spread out for everyone to see. Now let's do a scene by scene breakdown of the episode itself. First scene, already some stuff to talk about. And that's the compositing effect of the shadows here. These shadows, these are not drawn on the face. These are actually just a compositing layer being dragged across their faces. These shadows that you can see here and the shadows of the, his bangs, those are hand drawn. Those are drawn by the animator and it's part of the Genga. And if I go frame by frame through it, it looks very awkward because it's being dragged uh, flat across the screen. It's not following the depth that is supposed to be there on these characters, like a face is curved. So the shadow should move curved across the face. But because it's going across the screen so fast, it does not even matter. And those loopholes, that's what the affordable team is just so amazing at finding. Next scene, again, the 3D background. This is just amazing 3D background, especially for something as complicated as a forest. It's not easy to make uh, this easy a background of a forest. Jujutsu Kaisen fans, they know. The 3D animation, again, looks much better in this episode. I don't know why. It's still very obviously 3D animation. Like if I took a screenshot of this, it's still very obvious to say that it's the 3D. And I think the main reason for that is, um, there it is, the eyeball. I don't like the glossy textures that they're using on the eyeball. It makes it very obviously 3D. And I do think that's a deliberate choice. Ufotable is good at 2D, 3D mixing. They did that with Yorichi Zero Doll's arms that had 2D textures on the 3D arms, looked very natural. Similarly with Daki's Obi. Daki's Obi was just a masterclass of 3D, 2D mixing. But here there's not even an attempt to mix the 3D with the rest of the elements. I don't like it, but it's not objectively bad CGI. Objectively bad CGI would be bad modeling, bad CGI animation. Here, the model is very good and the animation is also very good. But I would prefer seeing this in like a video game or like a full CGI anime. When put in a 2D anime, this looks very off and I don't like it. That's a good looking cut and not because the CGI itself, but when the CGI plops down, the 2D smoke effects. There's something magical about 2D effects animation that allows everything to just mix together. It's the reason Arcane looks so good. It's not just because of the outstanding CGI animation. The 3D work is incredible in that show, but it's because of the 2D elements that comes from the effects animation that brings everything together so beautifully. Effects animation is so underrated. And in this episode, you'll see just how important 2D effects animation is. The reason I say that is because 3D effects animation can only look good in one way. And that is to look realistic. But 2D effects animation is far more flexible. You draw it in a realistic way, it is still very obviously 2D effects animation. You draw it in an extremely stylized way and it still looks fucking amazing. It's that flexibility and the fact that it can be used with 3D characters or 2D characters that makes it so appealing. This is not specific to this episode because it's part of the opening. I just wanted to point out how amazing the compositing and art direction team is of Ufotable that they're able to make seamless time lapses in anime format. It's not something you usually see in other projects, right? Because there's a lot that goes into it, like the flawless lighting, for example. Lighting is not something that exists in a 2D anime, but the way Demon Slayer compositing works, it's as if it's video game lighting put alongside 2D assets. The theme of the upper five demon combined with the slow pace, the way everything so slows down here, it's a flawless way of building tension. And Nonaka is a director who's very good at horror elements. Mitsuri entrance, and this is what I said about this episode's directorial revision, it's to make the manga panel in anime format. Also, these guys are definitely getting a view of her ass here. The sword slices is a mix of digital effects with hand-drawn effects. These are hand-drawn. And the blood is, uh, the blood is 2D. Very nice to see 2D blood in um, a Yuvotable project because their CGI blood, it does not look good. This is again, really good CGI animation. The motion looks great. The model is also very good. But again, as I said before, there's literally no attempt made to make this look like 2D. There's so much effort put into, let's say a project like Chainsaw Man to make sure the 3D looks as close to 2D as possible. And that is just not being done here. 
And I think uh, the characters, yes, these characters are also CGI. Made, they made CGI models for these two characters just for this one scene. Because if this was 2D, it would be very hard to do that. The CGI model is just moving so much. So having um, a 2D character placed inside a CGI model like this, the sense of perspective, it'll just be very difficult to do. Again, this is a scene with just, eh, it's poorly storyboarded. Uh, the way this is framed is very awkward. Mainly, I'm assuming it's because that you have to work with the CGI model. And when you work with CGI model, the frame, it's, framing, it's always going to be awkward. The storyboarding when you work with a CGI model is always going to be awkward. Sometimes the directors go completely ham and just keep rotating everything without giving it even a little bit of rest. Or sometimes you get weird storyboards like this with very awkward framing. That's why Yuichiro Hayashi is such a genius at storyboards. The way he directed Dorohedro, he made it look very natural. And he directed it in a way as you would direct a 2D show. Anywhere you would feel limited by the CGI, 2D animation was used. Dorohedro, nice. If you haven't watched it, please do. And I'm sure that Hayashi will work on that once Attack on Titan ends. I hope. Please, please. Mitsuri entrance and goddamn her legs are thick as fuck. Not just her thighs, her calves as well. Those are some thick ass calves. I didn't know I had a thing for women's calves. And yeah, the Yuki Kajira theme, it's so obviously a Yuki Kajira theme. Like Hiroyuki Samano has his own sound. Yuki Kajira has her own sound. It's very obvious when these two people are composing. And yeah, this is definitely not a Go Kimura soundtrack. It's a Yuki Kajira soundtrack. Not Go Kimura. Go Kimura is the animator. Go Shina is the composer. I hope you understand why it's confusing, right? It's not as confusing as like Yuki Hayashi and Yuki Hayashi working on My Hero Academia, but it's still kind of confusing. I wouldn't be surprised if the scene was um, corrected by Akira Matsushima. Yeah, the uh, way the outlines work, this actually look, does look like an Akira Matsushima correction. Really cool looking blade. The way Mitsuri moves is uh, similar to, let's say, a gymnast and her weapon is like a gymnastic ribbon. Demon Slayer mangaka does have really cool ideas, coming up with unique powers and cool backstories for every single demon. There are misses, of course, like Upper Moon 4, for example. I fucking hate that demon, so fucking boring. It's usually a hit. And yeah, from here on, it's uh, Go Kimura's animation. By Go Kimura's standards, this is nothing all that spectacular. A really cool rotation shot. I like these after images. That's just the compositing effect with the after images. Again, compositing team, just doing that extra bit to make the animation stand out a lot more. As far as storyboarding goes, this is a pretty good sequence. It really is like she's doing gymnastics, front flip to back flip. And I don't know what that flip is called. Uh, the spinny wheelie thing. That's what I'm going to call it. Yes, that's the angle that I was looking for. Very nice. This scene has amazing sound design combined with really cool 2D effects animation again. My heart would never flutter for those who needlessly hurt others. Violence rate drops to zero. Again, the whole fish is CGI and the two characters, the chief of the village and this guy here, also CGI. Yes, they do move independently. Like, look at these guys. Yeah, look at the way his head bobs and the legs move. Again, kind of awkward storyboarding here. I mean, who cares? Not every scene needs to look like it's been directed by fucking Shota Kushizun or something. Love this artwork here. I don't know if it's 3D, 2D or a mix of two. It's just a simple kind of modeled texture and just made to look good via solid compositing. I love it. This is the scene animated by Akiko Otsuka. Akiko Otsuka mainly works on My Hero Academia. She's like the main Todoroki animator and takes inspiration from Yutaka Nakamura with a few unique traits of her own. And that's this kind of impact frame. Same kind of impact frame that she used with um, the Gyutaro scene from the previous season. Really cool inky impact frames that transitions to pencil kind of impact frames. Cool effects animation as well. Otsuka has been greatly improving every time she animates. She made her best work with My Hero Academia's third movie. The scene that she animated with Demon Slayer was very good. And now again, another scene animated with Demon Slayer. Love the scene here, really well storyboarded. Just Nezuko dodging all the lightning strikes. Nice smears. Again, really well sh shot scene. I think some of them are CGI lightning strikes like this one. And um, the compositing works wonders. Your vision, of course, is mainly focused on the two characters, Nezuko and Tanjiro. But uh, you also do see the demons in the background. And the reason you focus on them so well is because of their lighting. Their portion is lit up pretty well because the rod is hitting the ground and the electricity, the source of electricity is there, right? Really cool idea. Love the slide there. Good animation. 
combined with fantastic compositing. The compositing used for the electricity has been fantastic throughout. Even with the weaker storyboarded episodes, the compositing has always been amazing. And it's not like the animation has been slacking either. Demon Slayer this season, it's still above the industry standards. It's just below your portable standards and below even Demon Slayer standards. Again, the way the electricity just pops in and pops out. Something similar, I've, I'm sure I've seen, seen something similar from Nakamura. I think it's the Deku scene from the second movie. Really like this. Now Tanjiro picks up Nezuko and he's the one running with Nezuko on his back. And now Nezuko just comes up with shit on spot. Like, that is good writing. That is how you write a Duke Sex Machina character. A character who can just heal people on command. A character who can just power up your weapon when she wants. It's not like she knows any of this, but she just does things. Back to the Gyoko scene. Again, Gyoko's theme just popping in. It's very sinister. And this is easily the best character acting sequence in Demon Slayer as a whole. The way Gyoko moves is incredible. Easily the hardest character to draw in Demon Slayer. Gyoko is a very detailed character, right? But it's not just the detail that makes him hard to draw. Uh, it's how unconventional this design is. You have to draw the mouth flaps on the eyes. But the expressiveness, the way he smiles, it's all, again, with the mouth, the eyeball and the mouth. So right now we know he's smiling. That's because his eyeball, the mouth eyeball, is pointing upwards at the edges, which is how you show that someone's smiling, right? That's just extremely unconventional. It's very difficult to draw something so unconventional when you all of your muscle memory is built by drawing conventional looking characters. Yoko never stops moving in this episode, which is extraordinary. Really good effects animation here. Again, the way the bubbles just come up. Like the degree of complexity this one scene has is ridiculous. Panning from the bottom with the pot to each faces of the characters and then showing the overall structure. That is fantastically storyboarded. That cut is amazing. Yes, again, that character acting is just so good. Really good looking smears. Amazing rotation shot. And when he breaks down the individual elements of his artwork, it's cool. It reminds me of myself breaking down artwork. Gyoko is just like me, for real, for real. Pretty sure this is auto-in-betweening. And this is the best utilization of auto-in-betweening. What would otherwise just be a still image now has movement and the way it moves is really cool looking. Go through it frame by frame. It's all on once, right? That's like a ridiculous amount of in-betweening. And it's just very fluid because it's on once. Um, but I'm assuming this has far fewer keyframes. If this was not auto in between, it would probably come down to like 300 drawings. And auto in between just gives us very cool vibe to the shot as well. It looks weird, but it's supposed to. People use the same argument for the fish, but I disagree when it's being used for that fish because that looks weird and also bad. Even with simplistic motions, there's so much effort put into Gyoko's character acting. It's phenomenal. Uh, the detail put into the blood really sells the scene. Very good shading on that blood. Extremely well shot scene again. I can think of coming up with something like this, but the execution here is just so flawless. It's incredible. Uh, the combined with the flawless character acting of Gyakko as well. It, uh, it does feel kind of awkward that this scene is in the same anime where these scenes exist. Again, the cocky expression. The cocky expression is sold so well. This is not the face of a typical character. The way you show expressions of characters is via three things in anime at least. Uh, eyebrows, very important thing. Eyes, another important thing. And mouth, that's it. Eyebrows, eyes and mouth, that's all you can use. This, I would say, is like that kind of a face. Uh, Gyoko does not have eyebrows. Instead, he has lips for where his eyebrows should be. So he has raised lips. He does not have eyeballs either. Extremely impressive design work. Character acting does not end there. More character acting stuff here. Really cool line work with the smears there. I love how the arms have inertia as well. Tiny little hands, they flap back and forth. The most amount of effort in this episode, apart from the Abe, Abe scene, was definitely put into this one. The tongues coming out of the eye holes and then it's creepy as fuck. Uh, he shows emotions. Oh, he's such a cool character. He isn't. Such a fucking boring Hashira, such a downgrade from Tengen and uh, even from uh, Rengoku. I um, hope he gets interesting in the future, but right now it's just him realizing that helping people is good. Amazing. 
His mist breathing, however, is really cool looking. This is definitely 2D animation. I love the inky look that the 2D mist has though. It's like 2D mist combined with absolutely incredible texture work. Yep, it's awesome. It's very well animated. Really cool morphing animation here. Look at that. The pot pulsing through his arm and then just coming out. And then the fishes come out again. This scene would look far less janky if the water was 2D. The CGI fish itself, really good animation, really good modeling, but again, looks extremely out of place. This scene looks kind of awkward. I wish it had a little bit more movement before they started looping it. Or I kind of wish it wasn't looped at all because I unconsciously end up comparing that sequence to Masayaki Kunihiro's sequence from the previous season. He's doing this, but with the tiny arms. And because he's thinking, he's, uh, he's doing this, right? His eyeballs need to be facing up and his eyeballs are facing up. There's so much thought put into every single motion that Gyoko makes. I have no idea why Gyoko is in Upper Moon 4 and the Huntengu, I think the other thing is named, why that thing is in Upper Moon 5 because Gyoko is just a far superior demon, at least from what we've seen so far. And it's very refreshing to just see a demon who's not just, I am physically far superior to you, right? That's what Akaza was. That's also what Gyutaro was. But Gyoko is not like that. You cut Gyoko's head, he dies. But he's just far superior because his blood demon arts are just so cunning. He's a true artist. Back here. And this is what I was talking about. Remember what I said about the importance of good 2D FX animation? Tell me that would look half as good if it was CGI. And the Ufotable team, they know that as well. That is some of the most gorgeous fire I've seen in anime. The outlines of the fire, the wobbly effects, it looks really good. I don't know who this guy is. It's definitely not Tanjiro's dad because um, his name was different, I think. Tanjiro's dad is named Tanjuro, if I'm not mistaken. And this guy is not Tanjuro, plus he does not have that scar that Tanjiro's dad had. And this is not Tanjiro's mother either, right? I wish they had more unique character designs, but hey, what can you do? And then I don't know what kind of expression this is on Nezuko. It's like she has seen this before as well. So she's trying to emulate that, or maybe she's just doing it on a whim. Yeah, the flow of fire is really well animated. Uh, how many layers of color? One, two, three. Three color layers plus the outline makes it four. So that's Tengen, Nezuko, Urokuraki, and I'm assuming this is Rengoku, right? Because he's the only one who wears the cape like that across his arm. Nanaka using Ufortable's resources to the maximum efficiency here again. Uh, the CGI background looks outstanding. So many individual components of the CGI background. It's all, right? It does not look like fat, flat textures. It looks like the wood planks all have depth to them. And it also truly feels like Tanjiro belongs in that space. And another zoom in with the 3D, really cool sequence. His gets the scar upgrade. I don't know how that works biologically, but I don't care. This shot is amazing, but the Genga for the shot is even more impressive. The Genga for the shot has the full body of the, both the characters. So I don't know why they only show this much in the final version. I guess because it's starting, yes, because the scene starts from all the way down the bottom and it's panning upwards. Because it's panning upwards, that's the reason there's the full body shown in the Genga, but that's kind of wasted effort. Another thing I do want to talk about is the way the fire moves here. The way the fire catches up to the sword as he just pulls it across him. I've seen fire up close a lot. I have performed fire stick rotation. It's very scary, but once you get into the feel, it's just like regular stick rotation, so it's nothing special. But this is how it works. Fire is he very heavy, heavier than you would expect. So it has, a, it takes a lot of time to catch up to the stick in this case, the sword. Abe scene. So yeah, um, I just broke down uh, Nozumu Abe's animation techniques, all of that in my previous video. So I'm going to try and keep this brief. I could talk for an hour about the sequence, but I'm not gonna. And uh, Sun Halo Dragon, of course, impact frames Nozumu Abe. He literally draws a Sun Halo. And then he shows the dragon as well. He builds anticipation and then releases it via impact frames. Beam of energy being released and then the dragon forms. Already an incredible amount of particle effects here, but I mean, it's Abe. Look at the drawings, they're so fucking good. It's Abe. I'm assuming there's gonna be an eye close up next. It's Abe, smooth as butter. So much of it is done in once again. The way that transitions into this cut is very cool with the impact frame. He's building anticipation after the cut again, right? Boom, all of that build up. So first of all, the cut itself, it's brightening up. Now it's pretty much white. Then we switch to a black frame and then a white frame. And then 
back to that scene again. So once you watch it frame by frame, it does not even feel like the buildup is being released. Only in motion does it feel like the buildup is being released. And the reason that's the case is because the way he's releasing all of the buildup is via the camera shake, the subtle shift in the framing. I'll put both of the uh, frames, I'll alternate both of the frames before the impact and after the impact. And you can see that there's a slight shift in the framing. It's the main thing that gives the scene that much power. Of course, along with the explosion of extra amount of debris and effects animation, Abe does that frequently. Build up and then release. The release is via effects animation. Abe also uses a lot of slow motion that transitions into fast motion. Look at how fast that motion was. Abe's classic smears. Abe smears looks so good. Really cool impact frames there again. And this is very similar to um, Ringo scene. His final form was also a dragon. Again, there's uh, the flow between the scenes, not that amazing. It just feels like you're going from one scene to the next scene and then to the next scene, but it's still fine. It's not bad. This is very cool, very unique. It's almost ba like background animation, very Utapon-esque background animation here. Again, very cool close up. I close up, what a surprise from Abe. Panjiro's blurred right now to put the focus entirely on his hands and the smears. They look so good. The thick line work on the smears as well. Then you see the slice itself, slow motion again, transition to fast motion. You see the close up of the dragon and that transitions into close up of Tanjiro's eye. More impact frames. You see a monk robe cut, I think it's called. All these drawings have a ridiculous amount of detail to them. Again, as expected of Nozomu Abe. Every single component here is also uh, 2D. There's absolutely no CGI involved in this entire scene. I also love what the uh, Ufotable team always does uh, as far as compositing goes for the Abe scene. They always have this unique compositing effect for the Abe scene specifically that they don't use on any of the other animator sequences. This is again a one-to-one -one of the double spread of the manga panel. I don't like these inky uh, smears, however, they're just way too obstructive. Yeah, they hide too much of the actual animation. You don't need that much, right? You uh, just halve that amount and it would still be enough. Um, I understand the argument that these draw these cuts did not have to be animated by Abe specifically. Like these are not all that complicated that you need one of the best animators in the industry to animate it. But that said, it looks cool because Abe animated it. Same thing can be said for his scene from episode six of previous season. A lot of the cuts did not need Abe's animation, but because Abe animated that, we got to see a lot of unique ideas. Like the way he showed uh, Daki's Obi was being stretched via smears. That's a very unique idea that I haven't seen before. But the whole reason we got to see that is because Abe is the one who animated an otherwise simple sequence. Similarly here, this is another kind of simplistic sequence that you don't need Abe to animate, but because Abe is animating it, you see his incredible drawing work, the incredible shading work, and of course, the outstanding effects animation. So many layers of effects here again. Nothing by Abe standards, but still industry leading. That just goes to show how incredible Abe is. The most fluid, head rotation you'll ever see. And then the way all of these effects just dissipate out. Damn, that's cool. I love Abe's effects animation dissipation. That's the terminology has come up for it. He mainly uses that for um, slices, lines. I'll show that again here. You see the line here? The way he's gonna make that line disappear is by causing breaks between specific points in the line. And then he's gonna thin out those lines. You already see the breaks forming he thins them out next. Part two of Nozomu Abe's animated spotlight is still coming. It's just such a big video. The raw video is four hours long. So it's a lot of editing work that's going into that. So I will release that, I swear. But I probably will release this video first because um, this episode is still fresh in people's memories. That's it. This is not an extraordinary episode by any means. I will, however, do a breakdown for the Upper Moon meeting, which was actually extraordinary. And I will also be doing an animation breakdown for the Toshiyuki Shirai episode. There's no way Toshiyuki Shirai does not work on Demon Slayer. So yeah, let's just wait and see how it goes. That's about it for this video though. If you like this video, leave a like and share it with your friends if they like the same. If you did not like this video, leave a dislike and tell me down in the comment section what you disliked about this. You can also tell me whatever the heck you'd want in the comment section. That's the reason for its existence. Subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff. And yeah, that's about it. Thanks for the views.